A Tiny Revolution features adults having adult conversations, which means that adult language is probably going to be present, just so you know. Hey friends, you're listening to A Tiny Revolution, a podcast about ordinary people living revolutionary lives. Welcome to episode 90. Y'all, we are creeping up on 100 episodes, and I'm excited to share with you that this summer at the Wild Goose Festival, we're going to be recording the 100th episode of A Tiny Revolution live. And fun thing, the first guest ever on here, if you didn't know, was the lovely and talented Science Mike, aka Mike Maharg. And um, that was right around when Finding God in the Waves were coming out. And so I texted him and was like, hey, you were on the first one. Do you want to be on the 100th episode? So I'm really, really excited to um, be recording that at Wild Goose Festival 2018. Yes, there are some problematic people who are going to be there. Yes, there might be a protest. So stay tuned for that if you want to come and be a part of the tomfoolery and excitement. Um, Anyways, uh, so yeah, go ahead and get your tickets for Wild Goose Festival. I'm going to be there um, next week in Spokane, Washington on the 18th at Whitworth University. I, along with my friend Austin Hartke, I just found out, are going to be speaking on the Pride Symposium, which we're very, very thrilled to be a part of. So go ahead. If, you ha- if you're if you in the Spokane, Washington area, make your plans to be at Whitworth University. We are really excited to be there. I'm going to be talking about owning your story and how um, you don't have to have basically like... You know, you don't need permission. It's going to be so good. I'm, uh, I'm fine-tuning all my, my notes for it. It's going to be ball. That's a free public event, so come check us out. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say about that stuff. Um, y'all, the person I have on the podcast today, I think I fell in love with her the first moment that I laid eyes on her. Uh, we met backstage at the Liturgist um, Nashville. Um, at their Nashville gathering, which was so much fun and such a delight. And we got to spend some like we did you know we danced and we drank and we boogied and she is just a light in this world so i'm excited to bring on the podcast the lovely hillary mcbride hillary mcbride is a therapist researcher speaker and writer who loves to see people grow heal and change and come into more fullness in themselves and in their relationships she's passionate about the well-being of all people and she wants to make psychology and academic research accessible to a wide variety of people which is something that we actually talk about in this conversation hillary holds a master of arts in counseling Psychology and is a registered clinician counselor, RCC, in good standing with British Columbia Association of Clinical Counselors. So if you're in British Columbia and you need yourself a shrink, call her up, boo. She can help you out. She can fix your life. Um, I don't know if she's taking new clients, but um, uh, anyway, she... <laughs> I gotta stop going off of my script because this is what happens. Anyways, Hillary is an author. She talks about um, one of her newest writing projects that recently came out. We talk about body. We talk about shame. We talk about connection and disconnection and reconnection. It has been, uh, it was just so good. I love, love, love talking with Hillary about this. And I think that you're going to love it too. So go ahead, grab yourself something to drink. Grab yourself a little snacky snack. And let's dive into this conversation with my boo, Hillary McBride. Me too. I know. It feels like so long since we were in Nashville together. I know. Just, you know, being hooligans, running around, dance, partying. Yes, that's right. Healing our fears. (sighs) Our fear that weekend. Yep. It was so good. Mm. And uh, tonight I'm actually going to go see our dear friends, Michael and Lisa. Oh my gosh. They're in Atlanta tonight. Oh my goodness. Have the best so, time. Oh, I've heard the tour for them has been unbelievable. So thank yeah, you for I'm, a good show. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. And if it's horrible, I'm just going to text them later. I was like, hey, that just like wasn't good. So. <laughs> He's keeping it real. You can always, yeah. always trust Kevin to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, just like, I will always tell the truth, but I try to be like more tactful with it. I know that I'm like, um, you know, Enneagram eights get that rep for being like too blunt about things. But like I've uh, I've experienced some some growth where like yeah. I think about the things that I want to say and then I wonder, is this beneficial for everyone That's great. involved? What a skill. Like especially That's like fantastic. on on Twitter too. Like I've noticed was like, yeah. do I want to fight with this person? No, I don't. <laughs> You're growing like, up. I- it's amazing. Um, my therapist and I just, uh, said, we just, uh, decided that we're going to go every other week now. So instead of being every single, oh, 
it's um exciting though because I've been going every single week for a year and a half, and so I finally got, it was like maybe like a month and a half straight mm-hmm. where I was just like, I don't know if I have anything wrong with me right now. Mm-hmm. I don't know like what I don't know what I should be bringing into the that's room. Great. Oh, that's fantastic. And I love to when I switch from whatever time of duration to something longer, often people get a sense of increased confidence in their self or competence because they're like, okay, well, I, I'm not going. Something came up and I can't, I can't just hang in there for two more days till I see my therapist. I have to either use some of my tools or have to resource myself in some way, but I know that help is coming mm-hmm. and it can mean directing the, the reach for help towards yourself or towards your mm-hmm. community in a way that actually creates more stability in the long run. So yeah. I think I love when there is that when you're at that place where where you're ready to to shift to mm-hmm. a little bit less frequent. It's a big step. Way to go. Yeah. And I think it's that people will think that like once you start therapy, you're gonna be in therapy for your whole life. And maybe for for some people that's true. But mm-hmm. like from what I'm told is that like most people don't stay in therapy like long term for their entire life. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are able to with, you know, the right tools, the right community, the right steps, sometimes the right medication, if you're like me, mm-hmm. like to actually be able to like, hey, I don't have to constantly be like circling around my trauma all the time. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. For me, it's felt really good to to see that in myself. Wow. Well, so. congratulations. I'm thrilled for you. Thanks, Fran. So yeah. for all you friends out there who are doing the, their therapy, stick with it. Eventually you get to graduate. That's right. And I think too, with therapy, I, whenever I see new clients, I often say to them, if you have, let's just say, um, 10 sessions, we'll just pick an arbitrary number, 10 or 20 sessions or something like that. Mm -hmm. Instead of going every week and then dropping off, it's actually a better idea to go a few weeks in a row and then space it out a little bit and then space it out a little bit more so that you are learning to flex your muscle on your own. And so keep going, keep doing the work. Um, but instead of dropping off, creating a little bit more space in between appointments is a great way to resource yourself. Yeah. It's been really good for me. Mm-hmm. I also like therapy, like, I mean, like before, like, it was like, has been the thing where I, I go in and like, I am wrecked mm-hmm. for the day if, I, if, I, if I'm like really tapping into something heavy. Yeah. Um, and now it's, uh, I don't know about you or how like you, you know, work through your own feelings, but like for me, like I need like a whole mm. like day to reset before I can get back into like the swing of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's any shame in that. It's just like having a lot more of my energy back is also yeah, pretty cool. That is amazing. Yeah. And it is like, I often think about the capacity to hold our own pain as kind of like a mm. muscle and that muscle gets strengthened when you use it. So it's easier to be like, okay, I'm going to flex it here. Okay, now I can rest. Instead of it being, you know, when you start working out, start working on a muscle, then the next day you can barely stand up or lift whatever. Or like if you've gone yeah. snowboarding or skiing for the first time in years, your whole body after is like, I don't know how to do this. But over time, if you keep doing something, your body has this incredible ability to adapt to carrying pain or to feeling sensation and to adjusting to be able to accommodate the increased load Mm -hmm. so simultaneously we're building capacity to hold but we're also clearing out pain so we have less to hold and i think that the sweet spot when they meet in the middle when the pain is decreasing and we're able to carry our own stuff in a way that feels um, not disruptive to the rest of our life Mm. well we just jumped right in we did (laughs) (laughs) That's how it goes. So if we were to, so if we were to pause for like okay. half a second, okay, um, Hillary McBride, if someone yeah. didn't know who the hell you were, how yeah. would you like? You're at a cocktail party and someone says, oh, "Girl, gosh. like you seem interesting. Like, what do you do? <laughs> what are you into?" Oh gosh, you know I love people and I love brains and I love bodies and I've happened to have found this really cool career where I get to sit in these spaces. And the intersection of all of those things uh, where you get to be with people to help them heal, to support them as they're going through challenges and to help people change stories about their bodies and what it means to be human. So officially, I would say I'm a therapist. Um, I'm a researcher, writer, speaker, um, have a few books out and whatnot. Um, But yeah, I think I just, I just really love people. And I really believe that we 
can heal and we can change the stories that we've been told about ourselves and we can take responsibility for our lives and, Mm -hmm. and move towards greater freedom and healing capacity with the right people and the right tools. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I've been really wrestling lately with this identity of being a therapist and how for a long time, being a therapist has been the thing that I say about myself first But it doesn't actually tell anyone who I am. It tells me how I support, tells people how I support other people. So it's this kind of like non-identity identity, identity, especially as therapists, we're there to be this container. So when I self-identify first as a therapist, I think what I'm really saying is I, I help other people find out who they are. But in, in my journey as a therapist, I'm realizing, or have been for the last few years, really wrestling with like, where is there room for me as a person in that? And, and how do I get to show up in this Mm -hmm. work that I do? So I'm trying to think about not calling myself a therapist first, although that is probably how people know my work most publicly. Um, And I'm at the very end of my doctoral studies. So I've got about six months left in my PhD. So that feels like Dr. McBride. I know. feels like a big milestone too, because I've been in graduate school for so long, Kevin. Like so, girl. Um, I just started. Yeah. I'm in my second semester, and it already feels I'm just like how much longer do I have at this shit? <laughs> right. And then what if they told you like another eight years? <laughs> See, that's the thing about like pursuing a PhD. Like I have like you and my friend Keith. Like Keith just started his PhD like a year and a half ago. And I'm like, how much longer do you have? He's like, there's like five more years. I'm like, five years. Yeah. I'm like, I did five years of undergrad. After that, I was just like, I can't do that to myself. And then I decided to go to graduate school. That's right. Yeah. Well, sometimes you're like, I don't like studying those other things. But when you find the thing that you're really passionate about, you get to research it or learn about it. It feels like this cool invitation into like more fullness of yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're like, I'm willing to put up with the burn because it feels really great to learn more about this stuff that I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah, that's, what, that's that's exactly been my feel for the past. Mm-hmm. Well, first semester was like yeah. I was coming out of tr- crisis of faith and like mm. coming out of survival mode, and then 2019 hit. I'm just like, okay, we're thriving now. Like, yeah, that's so great. It's been it's been a very interesting season because like I was talking with I'm re- uh, this is something I'm realizing. How old are you? Do you mind me asking that? I question? just turned 31. Okay, so like I'm 29, getting mm-hmm. ready to, to go into my 30s. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's like this this sense of responsibility I'm starting to feel on myself. I'm recognizing that I have an age difference between me and a lot of people who I'm very oh, close to. Wow. Like, um, just like, like a, I was, an actual numerical age or a felt sense of lived age? probably a felt sense of lived mm. age. Like there's like, just, I'm aware of that, that we are in different chapters yeah, of our books, if you will. Right. Yeah. So like, I look at my friends who are, you know, going through like a lot of insecurities that I have been through before. And I'm over here. I'm just like, what the fuck are you like so insecure about that? Like that's like some 20 <laughs> something shit. I was like, Oh wait, you are a young. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, and also like with things like uh, with dating now, I've recognized mm. and just like people that like, because I'm 29, that like, sick, like, if you're over like 28, like in gay boy world, people just like, it's a like, it's a wall between mm-hmm. you and like early 20 somethings because mm-hmm. they don't, you know, they see you as like creeping up into your old age and like, oh, gross. Yeah. And, and then I was like, okay, well, but n- th- now recently I started dating people in their upper 20s, early 30s. Let me tell you what, that is, fin- fin- it's fantastic. Yeah. My... But it, it's a. Uh, less drama and less having to deal with unnecessary mm. yeah, unnecessary stuff when people that come up when people are trying to figure themselves out yeah i don't mm. know but i've just noticed like this sense of like i feel older for the mm. first time and i don't hate it exactly because like everyone tells me that the 30s are my 30s are gonna be the best years of my life so i decided mm. like why don't we just do that do that now yeah You know, what's interesting, your statement about feeling older, sometimes that happens when people have been healing and they're not stuck anymore. Mm. Like we can have a psychic stuckness in the place of the trauma. And when we heal, we actually have the felt sense that we are past it. And so we have an awareness of being embodied in the present moment with Mm. all of our life experience behind us. And it gives us a sense of like gravitas of 
having lived through something where we're no longer feeling younger than we are. Sometimes we can get developmentally stuck at different ages where traumas happen and we actually don't grow up psychically. Like our bodies keep growing and we have a linguistic capacity right. to say like, yes, I can talk the talk. But the felt inner sense of like, how old am I? Is actually more, more related to where we got stuck in our trauma than how mm. old we actually are. So healing can often make people feel like I'm, I'm grown up now because you're all mm. of a sudden feeling as old as you are yeah holy shit that makes yeah. so much sense especially like i mean like i i can only relate it back to my own experience but just yeah. like being a queer person like the thing that we especially if you come from like queer christian community mm -hmm. you're like like that like for so many of us who talk about going through a second adolescence or just mm -hmm. like you're like for the first time right trying to figure that out like like so especially like mid 20 something friends like queer christian friends of mine like everyone's like well i'm kind of going through like they'll yeah. say like very shyly i'm going through like my slutty phase right yeah. now it's like i'm like okay, i'm like okay if that's the word you want to use but just like i just see this you i see this for you as like you are finally getting to like try mm -hmm. out your sexuality for the first time mm -hmm. and like but like the thing is just like none of us know what we're really doing or how to really do this or we feel self-conscious mm -hmm. and it's a constant rat race of trying to figure out like who am I going to trap with a wedding ring versus like who <laughs> might help me become a better human. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. Like now I'm over. Uh, I just, yeah, sorry. I'm just, I'm having a realization of like oh, how much that was yeah. true for me. That's yes. so interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think oh. that for a lot of the people that I've worked with in the queer community, like there is nothing wrong with having this you know, air quotes, second adolescence, the thing mm -hmm. that's problematic about it for people is the felt, the feeling that they're not at the same stage as their peers. So they're somehow behind or like, yes. I should have been over this by now, but it's actually really developmentally appropriate to at some point push boundaries, make choices, make mistakes, figure out who you are by deciding what you don't want to have happen, what you don't want to experience. But when you're doing that five, 10, 15 years later than your peers, all of a sudden it jeopardizes the sense of belonging that comes with knowing that you're part of like the normal stage of development. So there is like a secondary wounding that happens for people in this second adolescence because it, it fragments the sense of being a part of the peer group. Right. And, and so, and then it causes us to, uh, it's so interesting. Cause like, I, even not just within the queer Christian community, but queer folks in general, like, mm -hmm. I think about uh, some of the older gay cis white males that I know who like do like they're rich and they've got monies and like they are like midtown Atlanta gay boys, just mm -hmm. like you know, gay boys TM. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> you are so obsessed with like, and like they're all like, you know, going into their forties, have had surgeries. Right. And I'm like, you are really, really trying to hold on to this thing that you never got to experience experience uh, like because yeah. like youth within the queer community at least uh, among gay cis males is like yeah rised in so many ways versus like allowing yourself to just love your body where it mm -hmm. is and where it's at mm -hmm. and for everything that it's going to become that's right yeah and that is typically as well like a very western white perspective in other cultures age is seen as coming with status of being an elder of having something to offer of being revered and so we see that in the more post-colonial contexts that mm -hmm. age is actually something that can't be commodified the way that youth can be and so age is seen as being like used up but i yeah. i think it's really interesting what you're talking about with the preoccupation with appearance and youth because we see like as someone i research extensively in the field of embodiment and body image Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we know about preoccupation with appearance is that it comes from a, a place of restricted agency. Mm -hmm. So originally we thought that people who were preoccupied with appearance were like shallow, right? I, I've recovered from an eating disorder. And I remember hearing lots of people saying like, you just can't, you just can't care so much about how you look with it, which is a fundamental misunderstanding of what appearance preoccupation is about. It's this mm -hmm. channeling of control into a domain that we actually feel we have control over when we have in other domains experienced 
unnamed oppression and silencing and marginalization. So what do we do as human beings when we're off balance because we've been told we don't matter? We're going to find the thing that our culture values that we get reinforced about, and we're going to put a ton of energy into it. So the studies that we can see and the theory too about preoccupation with appearance extend really effortlessly into the queer community because this is a community, like I'm speaking as an outsider, but as someone who does research, um, this is a community, as you know, that like has been silenced and oppressed and shamed and marginalized. And what do we do as people when that happens? We do whatever we can to try and get control over the areas that we feel are going to make us more valuable and where we're going to secure worth and identity. Right. And I don't think that that's necessarily bad. I think that sometimes it can be harmful or problematic, but we're, it's fascinating to see how resilient we are as humans, that when one area of power and control gets taken away, how adaptable we are to say like, well, I'm going to find that in managing appearance. Mm-hmm. And, and so it would make sense that in the most marginalized communities that also have access to means that there would be this, this fascination or preoccupation with managing appearance. Mm-hmm. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. But we have to see that not necessarily as an isolated individual experience, but from right. a, a sociocultural framework, which looks at like, what are the systemic factors that are going on here, which funnel a person towards being preoccupied with their appearance instead of calling a person shallow or limited in some way. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Damn. That's it. All right, everyone. <laughs> thanks for tuning in. We've had a great time. <laughs> well, <laughs> but- you joke, but like, what is that? Does that fit for you? Is that making yeah. sense? No, that makes total sense mm. because, like, it is, uh, if, if it's not things around body for me, it's around like my hair, like my right. hair and like how I've colored it for so long. And like, that's true for many people's, like, yeah, you know, something dramatic happens. There's a, their, their homeostasis within their person is fucked up. And like, yes. I'm going to do something to take yes. control. And so um, for some people, it's, a uh, it's, it's appearance, other, and for, uh, you know, I know that you've talked about this in research, research extensively, but like, you know, for other people, it's food and, yeah. um, you know, controlling like what goes in the body, thus uh, dictating mm-hmm. what the body could possibly look like. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And you and it, recently came out with a, a book around this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So um, this, I can soapbox for just one moment if you'll allow me, but we've soapbox. got all this like amazing, amazing research But the problem with academia, and I could go for hours on this, is that there is this constructed hierarchy between the knowers and the not knowers, the knowledge holders and the people who actually benefit from the knowledge and whose lived experience dictates Mm -hmm. the knowledge. So in academia, we create this false hierarchy where all of this research that could meaningfully transform people's lives or help us understand ourselves and each other is kept in the ivory tower and, mm-hmm. and that's like symbolic through the language that we use to describe yeah. phenomena, to communicate research results. And so for me, one of my passions as a, as a feminist scholar is somebody who's passionate about um, dismantling hierarchies that are oppressive in any way, especially when it's about the growth and thriving of, of any human being. My passion has been knowledge translation and taking information that's accessible Mm -hmm. and passing it to the hands of people whose lives could really be impacted by it. So my first book, um, Mothers, Daughters, and Body Image, was about the the transmission of stories about bodies between women and women-identified people. That was my master's thesis, but wanted to make it accessible. Of course, published you know, numerous times in academic journals, but how does that actually impact people's realities? Well, not very much at all. It might be read by a few scholars or like influence a few theories. So the book, the first book was about all of the academic research I've done around women's relationships with their bodies and making that accessible. The second book that came out in, I think it was, was it July or August this past year of 2018? That was looking at including the body in eating disorder work. So historically, and this is might seem actually really problematic for your listeners, just anyone who's thinking about it can kind of put the pieces together, but eating disorder work has not involved the body. It's all about the body and yet nobody has involved mm. the body in treatment. So what we do is we say to people- so, in, so I, real quick, I, That's a clarifying question. Yeah, yeah. 
So when you say yeah. that people aren't, yeah, when they're not involving the body, like they were just trying to fix it as like, this is a mental problem, not a like body exactly. thing. Yes. So behave okay. this way, comply with this new set of behaviors that are imposed on you externally. Do eat this menu plan. Don't listen to how it feels. Don't pay attention to yourself. Don't form a loving, compassionate relationship with your body. Don't experience the goodness of your body. Just substitute this thought for that thought and away you go. And so treatment historically has been extremely oppressive in its nature because it's in, instead of allowing a person to have agency and voice, it's doing historically treatment is doing the same thing to a person that the eating disorder has done, which is restrict agency. Mm-hmm. It's creating the same conditions, which created the eating disorder in the first place. So just comply, just follow these rules. And then you are performing recovery in a way that somebody else is satisfied with it, but you don't know how to be a human. So this textbook mm-hmm. is, is a compilation of research from numerous scholars. It's an edited volume, um, which looks at bringing the body back into eating disorder treatment and looks at extensively what is embodiment, what does it mean to be in our bodies as a body, and and how do we use that to help people heal and thrive and prevent body-related traumas and body-related uh, self-harm mm-hmm. so that we flourish as people. And as of right now, I'm working on a book called Embodied, which is taking, again, to do what I did with my first book, take this academic information about embodiment and relationship with our bodies and all of the current research and everything that I found clinically and put it into a book that's accessible using accessible language for people, primarily people who've come out of faith context where they've been told your body is sinful, your body is bad. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even count the trauma for people who are in the queer community who've been said, and your body is extra bad because you want a body that looks like that, or you express your sexuality this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we'll have you back on when that one's good. Okay. <laughs> Talk through all that shit. Yeah. Yeah. But like that, that is so delightful, good and delicious. Mm. Like, and I, the thing about the past three years of my life, like I started, um, well, really just like the past year of my life talking about, feeling your body uh so i'm an enneagram eight you know and so we have a lot of like uh, a lot of energy that gets expressed as anger when Mm -hmm. not properly uh properly i don't know handled yeah funneled whatever you want to say it um and oftentimes like for me at least like my anger is like the surface emotion for something that's much deeper Mm. usually sadness or sorrow Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't until like I started getting into my yoga practice like a year ago and my dad went into hospice care that like I really mm-hmm. started to figure out like how how disconnected I was from this the the body that I have because yeah. again, again it's like you said like we we spend so much of our life like tr- learning the fl- you know the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak yeah you know it's the flesh that's the problem it's our bodies that are the problem. And, you know, when we differentiate ourselves from our bodies, it causes us to be at, at like, to have enmity with them. Mm-hmm. It causes mm-hmm. us to, like, uh, all, you know, like, people say, like, when I, I, I keep saying to so many people, like, trust your body, listen to your body. And for so many people, they don't even know what that even, like, possibly could look yeah. like for them. Yeah. And I well, just... We live in disembodied and dissociative manners. This mm-hmm. is like, this is our cultural MO is to be intellectualized to the point of dissociation. So for you mm-hmm. to say, pay attention to your body, a person's like, I literally have never been allowed to, and I don't know how. Mm, yeah. yeah. And then, how would you, okay, so like practical question. Mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. someone is trying to begin the process of like becoming more embodied, yeah. What what's like the the best way to start? So, well, there's a whole field of research about this that I can draw from as we talk about it. Um, I'm really influenced by the work of a feminist scholar out of the University of Toronto named Neva Peran. She created something called the Developmental Theory of Embodiment. So her, in like 30 years of research has been about like, how do we become embodied? 
And she says that there are three domains for embodiment or disembodiment. So there are three domains and they can go either way, depending on what happens in each of those domains. And, and then I proposed a little amendment to her theory. So I can talk about that after, but the first domain is mental. So shifting what we think about the body, if that's the only place that we can start because we're feeling safe in our heads, starting to add in a new story or be critical of the existing Mm. stories, either that we have told ourselves or are constantly diffused through our sociocultural context. So would that be kind of like the same thing as like narrative theory around the, around the same thing, like with a, a, like family systems theory. Yeah. They're like, absolutely the same thing around that. Yeah. So any kind of, um, we could even call it consciousness raising if we wanted to talk about it from a feminist perspective, but thinking critically, being aware of the stories that we've learned, both family of origin, context in our culture, um, and then the things that we also proliferate in our own way of thinking about our bodies. So catching our own thoughts, starting to pay attention being curious about them, and then even inviting ourselves to begin practicing new ways of thinking about our body. So again, that's that's probably the easiest entry point for a lot of people because we live in very disembodied, hyper-cerebral, hyper-intellectualized, dissociative ways. So that's that's a place where we can already, already hang out is in the mental. So shifting stories, um, mm-hmm. and I like what you said, adding in the narrative piece to that too. Um, and then the second one is actually the physical. So at some point we can't learn to trust our bodies if we don't have experience of our bodies as being good. When we think about experience, experience is held in our brains and in our brain body system in a much deeper subcortical set of structures than our thoughts ever will be. Experience is the thing that gives us a felt sense of goodness or safety or pride or joy in who we are and not necessarily connected to our thoughts, which is why sometimes people have the story about themselves. Like, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm a capable person. Look at all these things that I've done. Look at all these accomplishments I have, but they have the experience of themselves as being inadequate, likely because they've had that experience mirrored back to them and the experience of inadequacy or failure or aloneness or shame for so long. And it's held within deeper parts of the brain and they haven't connected the story to the experience yet. And they haven't had new experiences that they've taken note of and tried to integrate. So what we want to try and do is create a physiological experience of the body as good. So doing things that create pleasure or sensation for some people, they're having sex in a disembodied way. Yeah. So actually paying attention to sensation during a sexual encounter and noticing like, wow, this feels good. And where's the feeling of goodness? Mm -hmm. It's not in my abstract thoughts. It's actually in my skin. It's in my nerves. It's in my genitals. It's in my, you know, the feeling that I get the shivers across my body when I have a climax or having a person touch and like run their fingers across my skin. Mm -hmm. That's goodness. And where is it? It's in my body. So can I stay with it? Can I bring my awareness and my attention to the physical sensations of pleasure and be with them instead of creating these abstractions that are about ideas and cognition? But then I would say doing things like jumping on a trampoline, going swimming, (laughs) feeling the hot water, going to a dance class, going dancing, running, walking, um, getting a massage. um, What else? painting, um, the creative theater, Mm. um, yoga, Mm. anything that creates sensation in the body that is good and pleasurable and is about agency and choice. Right. And then being with that sensation and going, wow, that felt really fun or that felt really exciting. And where did the excitement live? Not in my ideas, but in actually the sensation and the movement in my body. Mm -hmm. So being in the body when we have a physical experience And trying to log that, what I mean by logging that is by crystallizing the information. And neuroscientist Rick Hansen has talked about how it takes about 30 seconds of staying with a positive experience for our Mm -hmm. brain to hardwire it. So when you have an experience of pleasure, and I don't even mean that just sexually, but any kind of pleasure or goodness that's sensual in our bodies, staying with it, almost like you're letting a piece of chocolate melt on your tongue instead of just like chewing it and swallowing it savoring it 
And what happens as you do that is your brain starts to collect those experiences of pleasure and goes, oh, wow, I guess like, I guess it's good to be in my body because look at all these experiences of goodness that I've had recently. Yeah. So we've got the mental domain, the physical domain, like climb the tree, go for a run, play tag with your friends. Like these sound kind of youthful, like youthful experiences, but often that's where the disembodiment happens. We are youthful and it's good in our bodies. And then we're told that's silly, that's foolish. And we get cut off in an embodied way developmentally when we're not allowed to play anymore. Yeah. So, okay. We've got mental, physical, physical. and then social. So the social domain tells us that based on our social context, certain bodies are given value over other bodies. Mm -hmm. So cis bodies or male bodies or white bodies. Like when you think about oppression, most experiences of oppression have to do with the marginalized body. They have to do with the body not being able or the body not fitting gender performance or the body not presenting as white or male or cis or whatever. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times our oppression is about the body. And what that means is that in social contexts, certain social contexts, we're going to have the lived experience, whoever we are, whatever the context is of feeling like we're not good enough because our body does not look like whatever the ideal is in that context. Mm -hmm. So we know from research that people who are, who have our, or are a body in a context where their specific body is not valued are going to have a harder time believing their body is good and Mm -hmm. feeling like it's okay and safe to stay in it. In fact, in contexts where we're told our body is not good, we're going to work extra hard to not be in it or to perform or to show up and embody somebody else's version of what a good body is. So what we need to do is find spaces and communities and social contexts as small as they are where we are shown non-verbally, implicitly, excessively that who we are as we are is loved. And we need those spaces so that we can go into the other spaces and do business and do work and live life and know that it's not about us, that it's about the context, the social context that makes us feel not good enough. Mm. You tracking so far? And I'm like crying on this end. So like, it's fine. (laughs) I'm not crying. You're crying. Oh, (laughs) shit. What's what's, what the tears are about? Um, I think... Uh, the thing that you said that like hit right in my gut was like, Mm. uh, it's not about your body or it's not about you. It's about the context you're in. Yeah, that's right. Cause like a lot of like my entire life, it's always been just like, uh, you know, the reason you look the way that you do is because you aren't the one who's working out. Mm -hmm. You aren't the one who's like, uh, you know, it's, you know, you don't look masculine enough or you don't talk masculine enough. Or on the flip side of that, what's so interesting is like, uh, I also like if I'm presenting more femme, I will never ever be femme enough to mm. uh, to fit into like a, a stereotype of what femininity looks like. Right. right. So it's so the, like, the context. Yeah, it's 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 Everything. all about context, and like yeah. it's when there's like a gender queer body in a space that like tr- shows up as mm-hmm. close. Cause like, I don't, I don't typically have like gender dysphoria with my own body. It's very mm-hmm. uh, few and far between that I have those, but just like, I am aware oftentimes that like, I don't look masculine enough and I don't look feminine enough. I look like, like there's mm. not, there's not a category in yeah. larger society for presentation like mine. Yet. Right. And so it's really, really tough sometimes mm-hmm. to, uh like i i think about this right now like with uh the guy that i'm uh seeing right now he's super Mm -hmm. super nice uh really kind also does it is not on social media and doesn't Mm -hmm. listen to podcasts so i know that he won't hear this (laughs) (laughs) but like um he's like you know he's like a a really really nice guy and he's like but he's Mm -hmm. also from south georgia and Mm -hmm. um and he's like you know he's a dude like Mm -hmm. like, so it's like when do I have this conversation with him? Like, Hey, like sometimes like I've mentioned wearing heels, I've mentioned wearing makeup. He hasn't like balked at it, but it's also just like, it's very different. Like when you're in the space, like with me and I'm wearing, uh, you know, a dress and heels and like makeup with a beard. 
yeah. versus me just talking about it. Right. So it's right. because, and it's about that, the thing about bodies and what's, mm-hmm. what's an acceptable body for mm-hmm. this person. So when I'm, and I think this goes along with like a lot of people in their dating life is like, how should I present or like, you know, like what, are the, what, what, what do I need to make my body into so that you'll love this body? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what we talk about in embodiment theory is that the body is the self. Yes. So the problem with the oppression of certain bodies and the rejection of the expression of certain bodies is that you cannot, as hard as you try, cannot dissociate that from your sense of self. Mm-hmm. So when we say your body doesn't look how we want it to look, then what you're saying is you, you aren't welcome here. Mm-hmm. And you, more, not just your flesh, yeah. you. Like, yeah. Like you don't look how you're supposed to look like That's on right. an existential level. You don't. That's right. Exactly. And the problem, and I'm writing about this quite extensively in, in this new book that I'm working on, but the problem with saying I am my body is that it makes us confront all of the traumas that we have worked so hard to dissociate from beca- that were related to our body. So when someone has been through or survived any kind of sexualized violence, uh-huh. it means saying that happened to me, not some yes. other other piece of flesh, not some skin bag that somebody else is responsible for and I can leave, but actually like that happened to me. And so it means that we have to get better as a society. If we are going to become embodied, we have to become better at, well, one, obviously eradicating oppression, body-based oppression of any kind, or just any oppression truly, but we have to get Mm. better at feeling our pain. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think we like, I mean, I could again soapbox extensively about this, but when you look at the rise of use of social media and smartphones, it's an incredible pacifier to numb us from our lived experience of what it means to be us in any given moment where we're left alone with our experience of ourselves with no escape. And what we're seeing is that as we, as we try to move further and further away from feeling our pain, our strategies to cope with what the pain of what it's meant to be us and what it means to be human, our strategies have to get more and more elaborate. And then they start to create more problems for us. Like, Mm -hmm. let's just say you have a knee injury and you start limping to make up for the knee injury, all of a sudden your hip is out of balance because it's straining to accommodate your other knee. Mm -hmm. What do we do because we have a hip out of balance? Well, we're going to sit differently and that's going to put strain on our back. So if you think of the original injury as being the knee, or as I'm trying to use it in this metaphor, like our embodied traumas, especially for people who are in marginalized communities, what we do to compensate doesn't actually help us heal. It just creates more problems. So to say, for me to say we are our bodies means we have to feel the initial injury, but ultimately allows us to be in alignment, body, soul, spirit, mind, social entity. So we're trying to compensate and we're getting further from wholeness and from connection to ourselves. Fuck me up. <sighs> Shit, dude. Mm. Oh, that's it. Okay. You have to feel the original injury. That's right. Exactly. Okay, so here's here's I want to go add one more thing and this isn't in per Anne's theory, but in my out of my research, it shows us that there's another domain. We've got this mental, the physical, the social, and the spiritual. Oh and so God. the spiritual not... Okay, I'm ready. I can receive it. <laughs> you get <can> ready. <laughs> right? What have we been shown? about our ultimate goodness, our essence, our value, our being, and our bodies? Have we been told that our bodies are broken, that they're the site of all of the wounding of all people everywhere? Sin, right? Capital S, sin. Mm -hmm. Are we told that our bodies are a doorway to the divine? Are we told that our bodies, and like I said before, there is no you that isn't your body. So even your sexuality is embodied. Where do we feel desire? It's in our body. But what if we've been told our whole lives that our bodies are, they preclude us from connection with God, that they're actually just temporary. They're just vessels. We don't need to take care of them. In fact, that's selfish. Or are we told spiritually that our bodies are actually the place where God dwells? Our bodies are the altar as they are. 
So for some of the people in my research, what we've seen is that people who have this sense of good, ultimate goodness, capital G goodness, that is intrinsic, that lives within them, that is not just imposed by social context and a community that says, you belong, but only when you're with us. But are there people who believe that they hold goodness in their mm-hmm. lived bodies? Those yeah. people are more likely to be resilient to sociocultural oppression because they can see it again. This interacts with the previous domain. They can see that the context is, is just problematic, but they are not. Mm-hmm. So the spiritual domain, I mean, the other side of it, I could say also is that in a lot of spiritual contexts and spirituality being not necessarily the leaving of the body, but the essence of being alive, the essence that drives everything and moves everything forward. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, scripture talks about um, it's in Jesus that we live and move and have our being like this undercurrent of everything. Is that undercurrent in us? Can Mm -hmm. it actually be in our bodies or how we've been told that our bodies get in the way of us being connected to ultimate love, to the ultimate reality? So we know that for people who have the sense of goodness in their body as a body, that they believe that God is in and through the body, it makes it way easier to be like, oh, you know, I, someone said something about me, but that's actually not truth. Or I'm accepted and I hold goodness Mm -hmm. wherever I go. I have everything I need on the inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, I, we could talk for hours about the I know. development of embodiment, truly. I know. And like, what's so interesting is like, I was doing this video the other day, which, um, did I edit, did I put that up on the internet? I have to go back and see. I'm so far behind right now on my work. <laughs> um, but like, I was talking with somebody, I'm just like, you're, I did put it up. I now remember mm-hmm. I did put it up. Mm-hmm. But this one person was just like, how do I grow in my, how do I grow in my relationship with God? I'm just like, you got to realize it's like, God is, you're already in a strong relationship with God. That's right. Exactly. I'm like, your body, like your God is your body. You are your body. You are with God. God is with you. Yeah. And like, and, and Jesus even says that, like, you know, just like, I want my love to be in them so that they will be in me and I am in you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like this right. whole thing of like, realizing that like this like this this is the temple this Mm -hmm. body that i that i walk around with and i get Mm -hmm. to pilot and i get to partner with um it's been just an amazing thing for me to just like learn to love yeah this incredible because like i and also just to give thanks for my body because Mm -hmm. in so many ways like i'm able-bodied i don't have a whole like my health problems right now are just like depression and anxiety and my hair's falling out and it's like that's not Mm -hmm. bad in comparison with so many humans who have limitations and handicaps mm-hmm. and so like what like for me like a big part of like starting to become more in my body was to be grateful and practice yeah. gratitude toward my body yeah. for what it's what it's done and how it's held me all this time that's right yeah yeah, yeah. starting with gratitude you know it's mm-hmm. there's a f- philosopher named merleau ponty who um he's a french some critical feminist embodiment theorists have a little bit of a problem with him because he doesn't talk so much about um, how sexuality and gender shape our experience mm-hmm. of our lived bodies. And he kind of has a androcentric perspective. But what he does say that's really interesting is that pain, pain is this beautiful invitation into embodiment because, yeah. because it means we cannot ignore the present that it's so easy to dissociate from our bodies until all of a sudden we have an ailment of some sort. And then we're like, oh, this is what present moment, like this is what being right here right now really means. And as I was telling you before, before we got on the call, before we started recording, I was in, I've been in some pretty, pretty brutal car accidents in my life and just had, was hit recently in a few months ago. And I'm really seeing the pain is this invitation into present. It's almost like every single moment is a meditation Mm -hmm. as I'm struggling with chronic pain now. And so I, I fortunately, unfortunately have this insight that supports me to think differently about it. And we know that chronic pain, right? Opioids don't work. Um, Sometimes therapies don't work. 
actually what we're seeing now, the most important thing that can help chronic pain is mindfulness, is changing how we think about pain and choosing where we put our attention and shifting our awareness of what's happening in the present moment. And so how we think about our bodies actually can change our experience of them. In fact, some might say that's the only thing that can. So starting with gratitude, like you were saying, starting with the appreciation of where you are as you are, if that's the only thing a person can do, that's enough for now. That's enough to shift the needle just enough that there are more possibilities of goodness around the corner. Fuck me up. It's so good. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh Thank my gosh. For letting me talk about all of my favorite things to talk about. Listen, this is <laughs> so good for me because I'm just like, I feel like I'm getting uh, more scientific language for things that I've been feeling yes. on, 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 in the spiritual. Isn't that so confirming? Because like everything you've been saying, like I've been reading through, um, uh, and we, I know we don't have time to go into this and so maybe we'll just have like another call sometime where we'll talk mm-hmm. about ancestors in the Bible where bodies are super involved, but like uh, Mark 5 uh, mm-hmm. Where the woman who's been bleeding for twelve years out of her oh, vagina yeah. shows up, and uh, and she goes up and she touches the hem of the garment because she knows, mm-hmm. and it says like she felt it in her body that she yeah. had been healed. I know. And like when you're <laughs> like once you're like once you're turned on to looking for those moments of embodiment in scripture, mm-hmm. it's almost like I'm just like oh my gosh, she had there access to the presence. She yeah. just needed somebody to show her, like, what embodiment, like, what does it mean to be in unity yeah. with the divine? And all she needed to do was just, like, believe that it was possible. That she, wow. like, and I'm like, and it was one of those things where it's just like, that means, when I look at that scripture, is that, like, we, like, it's almost, you said this earlier, it's just like, how do we kind of, like, take responsibility for our own healing? How do we, like, mm-hmm move forward how do we get up and fight through the crowd or fight through the bullshit of our own lives to touch the divine to, to, to get to really hear that thing that says where to hear jesus say your faith has made you well and that's what jesus wants mm-hmm. to say to us like we just like yeah we have to train our ears to hear it sometimes i think that's right that's right wow wow what a great note to end on preach hallelujah That was my conversation with Hillary McBride. You can check out Hillary's work across the internet at Hillary L. McBride and on her website, HillaryLMcBride.com. Hill, thank you so much for being with me. I really enjoyed it and I can't wait to see you again, whenever that is. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Hillary is also one of the co-hosts of the Liturgist podcast. So um, it's, you know, it's only one of the most popular progressive, spiritually art, you know, that kind of world podcast so if you like this show you're gonna love the liturgist so go check them out um and yeah um speaking of the liturgist i uh was fortunate enough to sit down with my friends uh mike maharg and and vishnu das um mike michael gunger while i was in la to record an episode about porn so as soon as that episode is live i'll let you know so you can go have a listen so i'm just so many things are looking up over on my end but um before we get we wrap it up just as per usual y'all if you liked this episode if you thought it was amazing, if you thought it was helpful, you know how you can make this podcast better. You know how you can make more content like this possible. You can become a sustaining partner on Patreon. Patreon is the easiest way for you to support the people in your life who are making the content that matters. So if you think conversations like this are important, and if you think there needs to be more Christian content out there, queer Christian content, um, if you want to talk more about body and shame, if you want like the revolution to continue, you got to fund the revolution because this shit ain't free, honey. Like, you know, I'm paying, you know, for graphics, I'm paying for designers, I'm paying hosting fees and, you know, 
you know, t-shirts only make you so much money. Is it's really, honestly, it's my sustaining partners on Patreon that help make my work possible um, without having to do a whole lot of side hustles. And I really want to make more. Um, I'm retooling how I'm doing a tiny revolution starting the summer. I'm launching a new podcast with a couple of my friends on sex and relationships. So that's going to be a thing. Um, I have some other ideas around like theology podcasts and other things I want to help do. So the only way I can do that is with help and support from people like you. So again, if you like this show, if you want more stuff like it, go to patreon.com slash the Kevin Garcia and find out what being a sustaining partner means. We've got Slack channels. We've got a t-shirt club. We've got some, uh, so many dope things. So go check it out. I think you're brilliant. That's everything for me on the podcast. Go ahead and follow me across the internet at the Kevin Garcia. And if you haven't already, please leave a tiny revolution, a rating in the iTunes podcast store. That's seriously one of the easiest ways to support the show and get it in the ears of people who need to hear it. Um, I think that's everything. Check me out at thekevingarcia.com. Queerly Beloved. My t-shirt line lives at www.queerlybeloved.shop. And I love you. I'm crying because I love you. If you haven't listened to Lizzo yet, yeah, go listen to her. She's literally so brilliant. So, till next time, uh, drink some water, to, uh, take your meds, call your therapist, um, hug your best friend, or don't if they are not a physical touch person. Um, but if they are, um, you know, hold on to them. Also, find friends who can call you out on your bullshit, people. I listen, I did something on Twitter this week that I was not proud of and I needed to make a public apology, and I did. All's well, water under the bridge. But listen, apologize when you fuck up you guys it's gonna make the whole world so much better if we could all just learn to apologize when we screw up um and stop getting so defensive all the time so thank you to um the friends in my life who call me out on my shit and thank you to the people who are merciful with me when i am being an asshole anyways that's all for this episode of a tiny revolution my name is kevin garcia and i'll talk to you next week babe bye b bye b bye